Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us for our first uh, online professional networking event. Really delighted to welcome four alumni, um, and we have here today uh, Kim Wood. Uh, Kim uh, was in Blake House and started um, her career as a chartering manager for Nord Offshore uh, before moving to P&O Ferries. Uh, she's now an associate director of Willis Towers Watson, uh, currently based in London, but working from home. Uh, Kim has had some amazing adventures in her maritime career, uh, having had the chance to board a container ship for her maiden voyage. Uh, she now insures multi-million pound vessels. We next have Michael Stokes. Michael was in St V, uh, left in 2013, and he joined the civil service straight from school, initially working on Brexit. Uh, he now works for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and I'm sure he'll tell us a bit more about that. Uh, Laura Herbert, uh, Cornwallis, 2011. Uh, Laura completed a degree in English literature uh, before doing a conversion to law, uh, and she joins Burkitt's as a trainee solicitor uh, in 2018 and is now fully qualified. And uh, one of her clients is RHS. Uh, Tom Peters. Uh, St Vincent 2012, he started his advertising career in Australia. Um, that was following a gap year uh, where he was doing uh, a year out uh, working for a school in Sydney. Uh, he's now freelance and has worked for some of the most successful agencies in the 21st century, including Agency of the Decade, Adam and Eve. Uh, although he was sure he would join the army, uh, his uh, life, his work life took a different path. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Elaine. Elaine uh, works in our IS department, is the producer behind this. And uh, please bear with us because this essentially is our first um, online professional networking event. So we're very excited. Um, please feel free to um, join the Q&A. We're going to essentially speak here from each of the four um, speakers uh, and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. But if you have any questions uh, while they speak, please feel free to post and we'll come to them later. So I'm now going to hand over to Kim. Kim, thank you very much. Hello, good evening. So I've got the joy of talking to you about insurance. Uh, I'm sure not many of you thought about working in the insurance industry. I'm not sure if that silence is because you're all on mute or because you're all having the same reaction I probably would have before I found myself working in this sector. No bleeping way. So during my early school days, I dreamed of being a vet. But this was before I realised I just wasn't actually very good at the sciences and this wasn't a path for me. So I thought, well, I love sport. How about being a physio? But the UCAS selection had different ideas for me. So didn't get any offers from the university that I applied to and my faith in the system waned somewhat. And while dreaming up of my next steps, which involved a year out road tripping around the USA, an opportunity to apply for an apprenticeship cropped up by some wonderful RHS contacts. Some of you might remember Don Hawkley. I can't really remember what caught my attention in the advert, but I think somewhere along it, it mentioned networking and traveling, and I thought this is for me. So after six month trial, I thought, I think I can stay here, and they accepted me, so I stayed. And this is how I found myself working for a Norwegian ship owner based in Essex for the next six years. Before this, I hadn't really ever heard of apprenticeships and they weren't really a thing back 11 years ago, scarily. But I can't even imagine to begin to tell you how this turned out to be the best thing I could have done. Aside from my dad being in the Navy, I didn't really know the first thing about ships. But since 2010, I've been involved in this fascinating world of commercial shipping, which has taken me around the world from Scandinavia to China and everywhere in between. Even though my job is office based and has always been office based, I've sailed through the Suez Canal on a container ship, have been out to an offshore wind farm and also on a bulk carrier while it was on her last leg being driven up a beach in India, ready to be scrapped. On top of this, the company paid for me to take professional qualifications, which led to me becoming a member of the Chartered Institute of Shipbrokers after three years studying on my own. But after six years with this amazing company, I felt that I'd learned as much as I could and took the plunge to move companies which I felt was the next step I needed to grow myself further. You might know the next company. If you've ever sailed between Calais and Dover, there's a 50% chance you've sailed on a P&O ferry. For this job, I was responsible for the chartering of ships and arranging insurance for the owned and chartered fleet. 
And this is where I dipped my toe into insurance. Now, I imagine the word insurance conjures up images of your mum and dad slamming down the phone after being ripped off again on the car insurance. But would you believe me if I actually told you it's pretty awesome? Marine insurance dates back hundreds of years and its laws and precedents are the basis of much of the world's insurances and not just for ships. Again, while with P&O, I asked whether they would pay for me to take some exams to further my knowledge and they were more than happy to. I enjoyed learning about insurance so much that after two years at p and I found myself wanting to explore this side of shipping more. Through my growing network, I managed to pin down the right contacts who were able to advise me of a possible job opportunity at an insurance broke house in London. I've since been fortunate enough to find myself working for one of the biggest insurance brokers in the world for the last two and a half years. I specialise in protection and indemnity insurance, which in layman terms means ensuring ship owners are, and operators have sufficient cover for their third party liabilities when operating their ships. I'm going to use an example to try and uh, explain this to you. Has anyone actually been down to Felixstowe and seen the size of the container ships entering the port? The biggest ships there can carry up to 22,000 containers. Now, picture one of these huge ships accidentally hitting the quay side, which results in damage to a crane and damage to the quay. The vessel sustains damage and leaks fuel into the sea, plus a couple of the crew members are injured during the incident. My job is to work with these vessel owners to ensure that in these situations, the correct cover is in place that their insurer will pay out to indemnify the owners for all of these costs, which can be millions. For tonight's chat, I've only been allowed five minutes to talk to you. And as I've probably demonstrated with my waffling, I could talk to you for hours about shipping and insurance. However, in an attempt to try and wrap things up, I want to give you three top tips. Number one, having a positive can-do attitude can put you in situations which, which opens unexpected doors. For me, take insurance as an example. Number two, continually improve your people skills and growing your network will be invaluable as, a, as your career develops. Again, for me, this has included random contracts, contacts from years ago becoming clients. And number three, not going to university may mean you miss out on getting drunk every night for three years, but it may result in you being three years ahead of, in your career compared to where you may otherwise be with no debt. So if any of this sounds like it may be up your street, please feel free to get in touch by the RHS team and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful, Kim. Thank you. That sounds really fascinating. And I know that obviously I've been watching you in your career. We probably, do, probably didn't know that, actually. But I have been watching your career with interest. And uh, it's very interesting that you've gone into the insurance sector. Brilliant. So now we're going to hear from Michael. Um, Michael, so obviously you joined the civil service straight from school. Um, tell us about your career. Wonderful. Thank you. So I left RHS eight years ago now. Uh, and when I left, I I had an apprenticeship lined up already, uh, but that wasn't what I originally intended to do when I was uh, going through sixth form. Uh, when I was at RHS, Modern United Nations had started, and so my first kind of calling to, was to study at university international relations. Unfortunately, I didn't get the grades to do that, uh, but I had lined up this apprenticeship with the civil service something which at the time was called the fast track apprenticeship scheme. This was a huge leap of faith when I took that step, because in this scheme and in this step in my career, I had no idea where I would end up, what role I would end up in, uh, or even what kind of skills I would be learning during the next couple of years of my life. I was incredibly fortunate because I landed on my feet and I landed right in the heart of government in a part of government called the Cabinet Office that works alongside Number 10 to coordinate how government works and coordinate all of its moving parts. My responsibility when I first moved into government was to basically coordinate all of the uh, government departments to make sure that their digital agendas, their digital priorities from their websites through to their services, such as applying for a driver's license or your next passport, uh, were all unified and they all had a similar feel to them. That opportunity was such a great step for me to go from the world of RHS uh, and learn those few early lessons that it's really important to learn, such as what to wear on your first day in the office, uh, but also slightly more complex ones like 
how drunk to get on a Christmas party. So after that first step, uh, I then had the opportunity to develop my skills in a couple of other areas, such as project management. My next step in this career took me to another part of the centre of government, uh, which was responsible for overseeing the delivery of government's major projects. I moved to that job in 2016. Three days after I moved to that job, the Brexit referendum happened. And ever since then, my career has been haunted, should I say, by that event. Uh, so I was responsible in that particular role for making sure that the UK was ready for Brexit, making sure that every government department had the right plans and the right strategies to make sure that in the UK we could continue to eat, we could continue to uh, do business and we can continue to thrive as a country. It was also in that role where I had the first opportunity to manage my own projects, to take, uh, to take those skills that I'd been taught and uh, had the opportunity to formally develop and actually deliver some real output, such as uh, a first bit of government guidance with my own name on uh, and various other cool little bits. But after three years in that job, five years in the centre of government in total, I was sitting there feeling a little bit stuck and wanting a real change. But instead of deciding to move out of government, I just moved to another government department. And this is one of the great things about government is even though it's all it's all work, all the government, it's all the civil service, every department is as different as a different company and you can move there really easily for new opportunities. And so I moved to go and manage a couple of projects with multi-million pound budgets. And that, for me at that time, I was only 23 years old. And to have that responsibility was the perfect step in my career uh, to learn the lessons of what happens when you maybe don't spend a million pounds the right way. And that's such a valuable lesson uh, that you can get in government early on in your career. And then finally, after delivering those projects, I moved to my role uh, at the moment. That's all about trade policy. It's all about making sure that the UK can trade with other countries in a really effective way. Uh, and most importantly, the businesses that do trade with Europe and with other countries do so really successfully. I could talk about it all day, but I'm going to uh, Move, move on just to a, a few final points that I think it's really important uh, to share that I've learnt uh, over, over my time in the civil service. One of them being that work isn't everything, can, but in your job, in your nine to five job or whatever hours you may end up working, you're going to have skills that you can use to benefit wider society. And so I really encourage you to think about those skills so that you can step out and like I, I'm a trustee of a charity and I'm also a primary school governor, these roles give you the opportunity to benefit society in a way that your regular job doesn't. And finally, if you're thinking, why would I want to work for government? My top three reasons to think about a career in public service and, and the civil service especially is number one, that huge range of experience I mentioned earlier. Two, usually, you get a great work-life balance. I'm about to take three weeks off uh, on holiday and so many places that isn't possible. So you usually get a great work-life balance. And finally, you get to influence people's lives in a way that you just don't in many other sectors. For example, literally today I've been writing a strategy that's going to set the direction for an entire industry for the next 10 years. And that's something that you don't really get the opportunity to do anywhere else. Thank you very much and I'd love to uh, talk to any of you who are interested. Michael, that's absolutely fa that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, wow, 23 managing million pound budgets, that's quite something. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, is that, um, you know, there's such a breadth of, of, of places and, and places you can work um, within the you know, civil service. I think actually, I don't know if you know, but um, uh, Sean Cudahy is now working for the civil service. Um, in the strategy 
Um, so we hope to give him, he's now a statistician as far as I'm aware, so we're hoping to get him back to, to come and speak to our math students. <laughs> um, so brilliant. Right, lovely. So now I'd like to hand over to Laura. So Laura, as I said before, is um, a qualified lawyer at Burkitt's. If I'm right, Laura, you're specialising in the in edu is employment law? Yeah. Have I got that right? That's good. Phew. All right, brilliant. Laura, yeah, so tell us about your industry and your career to date. Firstly, I'm not surprised that Akadahi is a statistician, of course he is. <laughs> but yeah, thank you, Lucy. And hello, everyone. I'm here to talk to you um, about a career in the law. So first off, full disclosure, I just want to let you know that I never thought about being a lawyer um, when I was growing up or at school or at uni. As Lucy said, I finished school, did an English literature degree. And then when I was traveling after uni, I ended up um, working with uh, asylum seekers from Myanmar in Malaysia. They've been displaced from their homeland because of um, relig religious persecution. And from that, I became interested in the law from the perspective of how it governs the relationship between the state and the individual, which is essentially what the law boils down to. I don't really want to get into the philosophy of behind why I find law so interesting here. The uni application or personal, personal statement section of, of this talk is that I think that by practicing law, you can interrogate and really be involved in how the law is actually applied in the real world in terms of who holds power and who has access to justice. So that's a very brief fancy bit, but I actually want to talk to you about the nuts and bolts of what it means to be a lawyer and how to get there. So what does being a lawyer mean? You've probably seen suits and maybe legally blonde, so you've got an idea of what the US media thinks the law is. The term lawyer in the UK though covers anyone who is qualified to, to provide legal advice. And put simply, the premise of being a lawyer is essentially being able to synthesize a lot of information quickly and then break it down and apply the legal framework to the facts. And there are two main ways to practice law in the UK. You can either be a barrister, so working in chambers um, as a counsel, or you can be a solicitor working in a law firm. If you're a barrister, once you've understood your instructions, you need to advocate or defend um, your client in court. Barristers are generally who you think of when you think about a lawyer. Think Whigs and posh British people saying, I object. The aim for a barrister is to create compelling legal arguments to put to a judge and a court. It's a slightly more competitive route and it tends to be best suited to someone who is really interested in like the nitty gritty concept of the law. Um, it's suited to a public, see public speaker and someone who is argumentative by nature. If you're a solicitor, uh, your work tends to be more behind the scenes. Once you've understood your instructions, you need to consider what the best solution is for your client, um, for the particular problem that they might have, clearly explain to them the legal risks, and then guide them through achieving a particular outcome through negotiation or a transaction or through the courts. This role is more commercial, more client facing, and it's more teamwork based. So what skills do you need? You need to be analytical and you need to enjoy solving problems. The thing that you sell to the client who walk through the door is knowledge. You know stuff that they don't because of your training and qualifications, otherwise they wouldn't be there. But what they actually want you to do is fix their problems. And the second skill that you need is excellent communication skills. You need to like reading and writing and talking. And I know you're thinking she would say that she's an English literature graduate graduate. But there's just no getting away from it. Reading and understanding the law, whether it's written down um, in statute from Parliament or if it's as decided by judges in court cases, reading documents, preparing witness statements, uh, court submissions, providing advice to your client, arguing your case with the other side, negotiating your case, all of it involves communication skills. And a lot of time, your detailed and quite specific grasp of the English language is going to be the difference between getting something right and feeling like you've dropped your tray in the mess hall. So how do you get there? There are a number of ways to become a lawyer and I don't really have time to talk to you in detail about this so I recommend you just google it if you're interested in finding out but essentially you need to normally get a degree which can be law or non-law and that's a three-year qualification can be four years. You then study for and pass a secondary qualification which is called uh, it's a two-stage two SQE test now and that's one to two years. And then after that, you do a two year qualifying period of work experience. 
and this is where the routes to the barrister and solicitor diverge. If you want to be a solicitor, you'd take a, a training contract with a law firm, and if you want to be a barrister, you, it would be a pupillage with chambers. And at the end of this period, you tend to qualify in or specialise in a particular area of law, which can be criminal, corporate, you can do mergers and acquisitions, litigation, you can do shipping, sports, media, football, li literally there's a niche out there to practice any area of law that you can possibly imagine. So that's seven years in total, five years of study, and then you start earning a proper wage for practicing law and your final two years of training on the job. I know it sounds long, I lived through it. <laughs> that's your route. So what is it like? Law, I know, is notorious for being competitive and having very long hours and being very stressful. And in my experience, I'm really sorry to say that I can't really debunk these myths. Like, yes, it's very competitive, whether you're getting into uni, whether you're getting a job, whether you're being promoted. And yes, you'll need to work extremely hard. And there are occasionally, frequently, very long hours. And the work can be quite stressful because you're turning around complex and high value advice in, in tight time frames. It's just the nature of the job. But I, what I will say is that while it's hard work, it's not dull, it's really fast paced, it's challenging, it's intellectually stimulating, and you get odds over your siblings on being your grandparents' favourite because they can boast about you in golf. Yeah, but what you want to know is how much money you can make. And I can't really give you any advice or guidance on this, but there are statistics for earning potential in the legal profession available online. And a lot of it is dependent on whether you're a barrister or a solicitor, where you practice and what area of law you specialise in. As a very general rule of thumb, you're looking at 20 to 25k starting salary, unless you're in the city where it can be 50 to 70. On average, once you're established, you're looking at 40k to 100k plus. And if you're a partner in a big city firm or a top silk uh, council, you could be earning millions. And I do appreciate that's a lot of money. But what I would say is that there are easier ways to make a lot of money if that's what drives you. To be a successful lawyer, you need to really like be in it in, for the law rather than the dollar. And ending on the same note as everyone else, top tips. <laughs> for those of you to, uh, who are yet to decide on a degree, uh, study something that you enjoy. It doesn't matter whether you choose law or another subject and come to law later. At the end of the day, the most important thing about your degree is having fun, learning how to learn, thinking critically, and the final result you get. And the best way to do those things is to study a subject that you genuinely like. Secondly, show you're interested in the law. How to do that? Well, firstly, obviously read the papers, listen to the Today programme on Radio 4, get a subscription to The Economist or Private Eye, watch Have I Got News to You, find a good wife or yes minister on whatever streaming platform you use so that you can show that you have background knowledge and that you pay attention to the world. And secondly, uh, do some free stuff and get started on it early. You can go to your local Crown Court, they've got an open, open public gallery that you can attend COVID permitting and you can go and watch real legal crimes going on, take notes and enjoy yourself. And you can flip between the courtrooms to find whatever suits your fancy. <laughs> the Citizens, Citizens Advice Bureau or the Refugee Service or any legal advice centre is another really great place to start as soon as you finish school. Um, they're all charities that provide advice to people and they're always looking for volunteers. And lastly, be interesting. Qualifications are important for sure, they get you to the front door of an interview, but to give you some context at Burkitt's where I work, we take on around 15 new trainee solicitors every year and we get around a thousand applicants for those 15 places and every one of those students has a good A-level result or a 2-1 degree from a good university, otherwise they just wouldn't get past go. So everything else being equal, how do you make yourself stand out to the recruiter? And it's the other bits that make you you, whatever that is, with its politics, cooking, traveling, reading, crochet, fast cars, open water swimming, campaigning for social justice issues. I'm convinced that I got my job because I do some hot air ballooning with a friend from RHS and the, and the recruiter was interested in that. My advice to you is that invest your time in actually pursuing whatever interests you and make those connections and develop the people and the communication skills from that. That's fabulous. Thank you. That's absolutely fascinating, Laura. And uh, quite scary, the thought that actually, um, yeah, a thousand applicants to 15 places. I think it's a very competitive market out there. It really is. Wow. Right. Now over to Tom. 
Um, so yeah, Tom uh, was planning to join the, the army um, and following his gap year in Australia, uh, entered the, uh, uh, the sector of, of advertising. So Tom, please tell us about uh, your journey. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, I'm going to try and do my best to, to keep this to five minutes and, and not bore you all. Um, but it's something I've obviously been uh, very passionate about um, in the seven to eight years that I, I've been working in um, creative agencies uh, in both the UK uh, and Australia. Um, I'm what is called uh, an account or campaign director, depending on the agency you work at. Um, I'm working on uh, Deliveroo at the moment. Um, the uh, food technology um, app company um, at an agency called Pablo. Um, but previously, I, I've worked on an array of different clients. So uh, John Lewis, Marks and Spencer, Polestar, uh, which is an EV brand, um, Glenn Fiddick, the whiskey, EA Sports and, and Heineken, to, to name a few. Um, but like cre a creative agency, um, you've probably not heard of that before. Uh, you've just heard it as advertising. So really what that is and what it means is um, we, we concept and, and deliver TV ads, um, we artwork, um, print and um, outdoor advertising as well as creation of, of social ads um, and yeah you, you'll be familiar with advertising as a whole but um, it is very much uh, more than that it's, it's beyond creating sort of the pretty pictures and shooting beautiful ads um, that's the end product that you'll see as a customer and as you're sort of walking down the street or flicking through on your on your mobile phone um, but sort of agencies create and, and deliver ads um, for brands but it's more about uh, solving complex business problems um, and behavior change um, and, and my job really and what I do every day is managing and, and owning those relationships with with clients and, and brands um, and working closely with an internal team of strategists uh, creatives um, and producers, um, you know, to deliver a project uh, end to end, um, essentially being kind of the glue that holds uh, everything together um, and making sure that at the very end of the project, uh, we make, you know, it is effective as it possibly can be, right place, right time, right customer, right format, um, etc. Um, it's uh, a fantastic industry, one I hold very close to my heart. Um, I would argue that it has some of the most creative uh, and skilled people um, in it um, and that's part of I think heart and heart why I enjoy working on an everyday basis you just you kind of you're touching um, you know shoulders with uh, people who have come from various different backgrounds um, and have got lots of different skill sets to come together to create these ads um, or solve these problems for brands. Um, as Lucy said I, I began my career uh, in Australia whilst I was traveling. Uh, definitely was something I, I fell into. Um, I was going to be joining the army um, after 12 months uh, of a gap year, which I'm sure many of you might be thinking of doing. I highly recommend it. Um, you can, you know, go and find yourself as they say, but you know, I really did kind of fall into something I, I wasn't planning on doing and, uh, you know, I'm better for it. Um, could have ended up in the army, could have, you know, uh, or, you know, could have uh, found a you know, different career as I have done. Um, whilst I was there, I did work experience at two agencies, um, one called Ogilvy Mather and the other one called Droga. Um, both, if you have a look online, um, have sort of internships and, and, and programmes um, in the UK as well. Um, I, I was working there, lots of different departments, got a you know, wide range of experience and decided that was the route I wanted to go down. I went into kind of working, um, you know, uh, either with the creative department or client services. I applied to something called um, award school over there, which was um, basically creative um, idea generation. So if you're really like good at drawing or writing, it's taking those kind of skill sets and turning them into being able to solve um, problems, business challenges, um, you know, campaign briefs and, and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, from there, uh, decide. Uh, decided like, I need to really look at some different internships and programs to kind of get my foot in the door which I'd argue probably is the hardest hardest part um, you know if you don't know anyone in that industry it is a little bit hard you know hard to kind of know where you should go or which direction you should turn in but um, I think it's something that's getting um, better sort of in the last sort of five years um, and something I'm very happy to help you all with as well if you're interested 
Um, but I applied to a graduate scheme at DDB in Sydney. Um, I was their first international graduate. Um, and I think from there it, was, it got really exciting. You know, I was 12 months there working there, doing courses in my free time um, and then moved back to, to London um, where I worked at um, Adam and Eve DDB um, and you know, got some really reputable clients there. You'll know sort of John Lewis, Waitrose, EA Sports, uh, Adidas, um, Desperados, Cronenberg, H&M um, to name a few. Um, and really that saw me doing everything from uh, the John Lewis Christmas campaign one year, so Bust of the Boxer, um, to rebranding and, and modernising the UK's you know uh, favourite department store and, and grocer, so John Lewis and Waitrose, um, launching a, a new piece of football tech um, with EA Sports and Adidas, um, and then also working on something completely different to trying to reduce the number of road deaths in England um, with Highways England. So very rare, varies and you know sometimes working on those at the same time so your day can can take you know different forms of what you're doing. Um, I thought it's worth mentioning as well like the different types of um, jobs and, and roles available so I've mentioned you know I'm, I work in client services so only the relationship with, with the client making sure we're hitting you know um, briefs and objectives uh, as you should be. There's strategy which is very much like having the customer's interests at heart and you know, finding insights into them and how best to, to target uh, customers or consumers to creative where you're generating ideas that captivate and, and trying to build, uh, build brand recall. And then producers who are really the like delivery specialists in bringing a concept to life. Um, and you know, there, there are lots of different paid internships as I mentioned before um, across all of those different jobs and, and roles, so you should definitely, you know, have a look into that if you're if you're interested. Um, I can also give you the names of key agencies I know for facts um, that are doing that. Um, and I think it's like to kind of round it all off. It's uh, you know why should why should you care? Why you know why is this a career um, for you? Um, I think it one if you're creative minded, you'd be very suited to this. Um, if you like the idea of uh, creating business um, solutions and, and changing people's behaviours, you know, for the better, um, that's you know another another reason to do it. Um, you're involved in, you know, you could be involved in shaping the roadmap or the journey for a brand for like the next five to ten years and working on brands that you love and, and know. Um, and then, you know, finally, as I've said before, it, it's one of the most creative industries in the world, I think, and in, in at the end of the day, you get paid to create fun content and ads, which you can definitely say to your nan, that TV ad I made or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's uh, in a nutshell, advertising, creative industry. Um, happy to answer any questions that you have this evening or, or at a later date um, via Lucy and the RHS team or reach out on LinkedIn. Thanks. Great, Tom. Thank you very much. So, um, wow. I think um, I think I've learnt more about four different industries than I've learnt probably in about twenty five years of working. So, thank you. And what I, what actually comes over is you're also passionate about your industries. And, and I think you'll probably all agree that you know it's really important to find an industry you're interested in, because you're in, if you're interested in it and um, enthused about it, that actually you you find that you'll enjoy it more and also. Um, be good at it, I think, and uh, clearly all four of you are very successful in what you're doing. So thank you. Um, so I've got a few questions to start off with, and um, I think really what I'm interested to find out is really what the recruitment process is like for each of your industries. I know, Tom, you were talking about um, apprenticeships and uh, you know, degree apprenticeships and further study. But um, yeah, so Michael, um, can you tell me what yeah, you talked about um, uh, the fast track apprenticeships? What kind of apprenticeship, what's the process now for recruitment within the civil service? Wonderful, yeah. So there are really three entry ways, uh, four, four entry ways to, into the civil service now. The first is like I did, going through, through an apprenticeship. When I first joined, apprenticeships were completely new to the civil service. They, there just weren't any around. Uh, and But they set up a new scheme in 2013 to, to tackle that and to get younger people into the civil service. That scheme lasted for a few years as government were finding its feet in this space of school leavers. Uh, now, if you went on to www.civilservicejobs.gov.uk, uh, 
you'll find a whole range of apprenticeships from engineering apprenticeships with the Ministry of Defence uh, through to cyber security ones with uh, MI6 uh, and some other really interesting ones. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the equivalent to how I joined. Another scheme which is really well known is the Fast Stream, which is their graduate scheme, uh, which is really quite competitive, but allows uh, high quality graduates uh, after university to join and to go through several jobs in a fairly short space of time. The other two entry routes are less of a formal scheme, uh, but they are kind of just applying for a job. The civil service has jobs for uh, for people at all levels that you can just apply for online at civilservicejobs.gov.uk. Uh, and so that is a really good way if you are, if, if maybe you didn't get into university this year, but you're thinking of applying next year, maybe try out for a few jobs at, a, at an entry level because then you'll get a year's worth of work experience uh, really easily. And then the final way is if you've already had a career so far, if, you, if you're a few steps down in your career or you've had one job, there's then experience entry to take those skills and apply them to other new jobs. So all of those can be found on civilservicejobs.gov.uk uh, and the actual application process has some niche uh, some small quirks about the civil service and public sector hiring and if you're interested in applying for any of those jobs or thinking about any of those schemes do get in touch and i can talk you through some of those challenges and i've done that with several previous uh previous students as well fantastic thank you michael that's really really helpful um yeah kim coming to you a sim similar question really you know, um, what kind of opportunities are there for different entry levels uh, within the insurance industry? So I, uh, I, I joined it from a very different angle to probably 90% of people um, by falling into the shipping world and then sort of scooting across. I sort of landed in there, but I, I worked for a big uh, big company called Willis Towers Watson and and they similar to what Michael was just saying they have an apprentice um, route but they also do grad schemes as well and interestingly actually I joined and because I felt that I landed into insurance I sort of put my hand up and said oh look you know can I do some exams while I'm uh, while I'm new to it and it, it turned out they had what they call um, a professional development program so even though I've got eight years of experience behind me. They put me into almost what they're doing with the apprentice, uh, the apprentices when they join um, and you get some tutors and as well as getting um, a certificate in insurance and a diploma that I'm doing, there's a diploma in insurance as such. So it's not just the CII exams and, and it's meant to be this broader thing and you're meant to be able to explain bits of insurance that have nothing to do with me. I, you know, I sit in the marine world, but actually learning about more generic um, product liability or home insurance and things like that it just gives you that little bit of a grounding um, and you know pretty much most big firms will be doing apprentice and grad schemes but also you know look out for those little firms that I know apprenticeships are a lot more out there and I would highly recommend apprenticeships so just keep your eyes peeled you know maybe in the local papers I know Willis has a really good website and I actually had a little look earlier there's there's um, I think they, they might describe a role as an, an analysis or something like that, but it just gets your foot in the door and it can be in really interesting areas. I mean, shipping sounds really boring, but part of shipping <laughs> and the marine world actually sits high end um, racing horses, really random, um, jewellery. Um, we have high end wealth clients, so they're super yachts and they're supercars. For some reason, it all sits in marine. <laughs> so I get to see all this cool stuff as well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think like everybody has said, just don't get fixated on something you think you might want to do. Do something you enjoy, see where the road takes you and uh, hopefully you land an in insurance. Brilliant. Thanks, Kim. That's really helpful. Um, I'd love to just, just touch on the work experience, essentially, you know, especially for those that went to university. Um, maybe Laura, you know, did you did you do um, have jobs? Um, yeah, have jobs in between, you know, in the holidays and things. And, you know, if so, how did you apply for them and uh, and how did you get on? I did lots and lots of non-law work between university and getting my degree. So I did two ski seasons. I travelled a lot. 
Um, I did lots of waitressing, lots of bar work. <laughs> but in terms of legal work, I went and I was a pupil, a mini pupil they're called, for a council um, in Chambers. So I watched, I like studied under him for three weeks and we went to the Crown Court and uh, Colchester Court and we were in Ipswich Court here. Um, so I just, that was mainly through petitioning him and trying to make, trying to um, get an opportunity in, in his chambers. And then I, you, it's quite a formal process for solicitors. So I'm a solicitor route and the way that you get work experience through uh, law firms is to apply for a vacation scheme and they, um, a vacation scheme in practice is like a two week uh, essentially job interview. Um, and at the end of your vacation scheme, you then either get offered a training contract or, or you don't. So, so there's not that, that many opportunities to do work experience necessarily in law firms until you are at the stage where you are qualified enough to be progressing on to um, approaching a, a training contract. But as I said, worth going to, to do work experience at um, yeah, Citizens Advice Bureau, any legal advice centre, uh, any refugee centre, anything where you're using your communication skills to advise people will be will be helpful in the long term. Great, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Um, so, Tom, you talked a bit about work experience uh, in in the uh, creative industry. I know it's some um, like probably the other industries very very um, uh, competitive. What would you say, um, you know, if you were to approach one of the agencies you've worked for, what would you say um, is the, to, how, how would you make your, yourself stand out? You know, how do you create a standout CV? You know, what do you think would make the, you know, something pop and everyone, so, someone within, you know, your agency say, yeah, we must bring that person in for a couple of weeks. I think part of the apologies, I think my mic was off. <laughs> um, part of what we're doing um, in advertising is just selling down information and messaging. So I think it's making, uh, it probably sounds really yeah, silly, but making your CV just like short, sn snappy, um, and you know, uh, thinking about how you present that um, information as well. Um, your, you know, ultimately trying to capture someone's attention in like seven seconds. Um, on, with CV. So if you can do that in an interesting way, like think outside the box, essentially, like it doesn't have to be a, a four piece of paper or, you know, however they're, you know, a PDF um, just on like a Word document. It could be you present it and package it up in a completely different way. However you do it, you know, it is capturing their, their attention um, in that way. Um, uh, I think ultimately as well trying to get um going through contacts always helps um people are you know when you're applying to these internships um doing what i just said is really useful but if you have got contacts and you can go through that way um always always useful definitely hit those up and you know i'm, I'm also very happy to help it's a small industry kind of once we're in and um, so you know I, you can always be um speaking to ex-colleagues or if you know anyone who works in that industry definitely get them up for a work experience. Um, no work experience is bad experience in, in, in that sense. Um, you should definitely just chuck yourself into, into different things. And if you can kind of show how creative you are as well, um, it doesn't have to be graphic design, that's always really useful. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. That's really helpful. I think, um, yeah, I think it's really important for people to understand that um, uh, work experience is experience. So actually, it's just as important to find out what you don't want to do or what you don't enjoy as to what you do. Um, and more often than not, you'll find out what you don't want to do pretty quickly, um, be able to move on and find something else. Uh, what I'd be interested to find out from each one of you um, for the last sort of few minutes uh, is uh, ultimately what you did at RHS that you think uh, gave you the skills to be successful in the workplace because I know that essentially you all did very different things different activities so if I could just ask each of you individually um, to let me know you know what what you did at RHS what you enjoyed what you didn't and what what you thought what things activities you did that you think helped you to become the person you are today and uh, in the industry that you're in uh, should we start with you Kim
definitely being head of band. I mean, playing the cornet has been an invaluable uh, experience for the rest of my life. <laughs> I sadly haven't actually played since leaving uh, on the speech day, but uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I, I was in sports teams, I was in the band, um, my mum and dad were uh, posted abroad at the time. I think it's that independence and people skills and just, you know, learning how to talk to people. Um, I think like Laura said, uh, quite a bit of just wanting to, wanting to talk to people, wanting to help people. And I think just, that ability to dip your toe into things and have a go. Um, I see on the side, someone's asked a question about networking, which sort of ties into that and and how you do networking. And, you know, I, as much as it sounds very obvious, it is just about meeting people. And, and, and <laughs> I think lunches and going to meetings and just being involved in a lot of different things I think that's the only way I can uh, explain how I think I've got to where I am. For me, uh, it's definitely a uh, about the ability to live with other people. Uh, being at RHS, you come into contact with a huge range of people, not all of whom you're going to get on with. Uh, and I was lucky enough to spend six years of my life with uh, people that I didn't get on with that that well, but actually stepping then into the world of politics and the civil service, having the ability to engage civilly and engage with people who you vehemently disagree with on many issues is so vitally important to hold hold your head and stay calm when everything else is falling to pieces is such a skill that so many other people out in the world don't get that, uh, that your kind of experience at RHS gives you. Uh, and that, that for me has kind of got me where I am today. Um, so I would say that, I don't know if you still do this, but when I was at school, if you were captain in of the first team 11, you used to have to stand up in assembly in front of everyone and read like a five minute dull match report to the whole school. <laughs> um, so that was excellent experience for public speaking because it was terrifying. Um, Similarly, uh, debating all those kinds of things, even uh, if you take a leave of songs of praise, um, if you pick a song and, and talk about that in the chapel, those kinds of things will build up your confidence um, in terms of public speaking and, and being able to form your thoughts quickly on the hoof. So that's useful. I would also say, um, yeah, lot, I, I played quite a lot of sport at school and that's been really helpful in, in terms of um, teamwork and I captained a few sides, so that was helpful in terms of leadership. Um, and just the, the breadth of experience. As I said, I made friends with someone who flies hot air balloons and which I've done uh, since then. I, I can talk in interviews about in the CCF flying a plane, for example, which is, is unusual. Uh, even I, I don't like mentioning it, but talking about divisions, again, it's just it's just something that, that will make you stand out from, from other people and, and boarding too. Um, and as everyone else has said, it's those is being able to to rub along with people from all different walks of life that um that that will yeah stand you in really good stead for for networking in particular and yeah your career well really i think that's probably us done for the moment um i'd like to thank you all so much for your input and uh and spending an hour with us this evening uh we've recorded this so we'll be able to put it out on social media um, and obviously it's there for posterity for you to show your family and your children in years to come.